National Black Coalition of Federal Aviation Employees. I hope by now you've been able to attend one or two of the events that we had, which kicked off last Wednesday with the opening ceremony where we learned a little bit about Emory C. Malik, who turned out to be the first African American to receive the pilot's license from the FAA. That was a very interesting event if any of you were able to attend. And then as a prelude to this fantastic event that we're getting ready to get started, we showed the movie Harriet on Wednesday in this same room just to give people some understanding and a bit of history and just to get their minds ready to be prepared to engage with the fantastic guests that we have here today. So without further ado, let's go ahead and get started. This event today is to commemorate and honor one of our greatest American heroes, Ms. Harriet Tubman. If you're not aware, Ms. Harriet Tubman was an American abolitionist, a political activist. She was born to enslaved parents in Maryland and escaped and subsequently made some 13 missions to rescue well over 100 enslaved people. The numbers are uncertain. It could be more than 200, including family and friends, using a network of anti-slavery activists and safe houses known as the Underground Railroad. So today, we're going to start off this event with a brief reenactment of Harriet Tubman by Ms. Lakeisha Small Davis, who also is the POC for today's event. So please give her a warm welcome once I finish with her bio. Ms. Lakeisha Davis Small is a native Washingtonian who spent her childhood years doing research at the Walter T. Daniel Library in the city's historic Shaw neighborhood. She drew inspiration for Harriet Tubman's story, and she was also born to who was born to enslaved parents in 1820 in Dorchester County, Maryland. Like Tubman, Lakeisha is interested in the issues concerning African Americans and humanity as a whole. Among her volunteer activities in the community, Lakeisha has spoken at events addressing the needs of victims of sexual assault and domestic violence. Lakeisha is also on the advisory board for the Harriet Tubman Learning Center, which is based in Atlanta. One of Lakeisha's favorite quotes is, even if I teach one person, if only one person hears, I think that's I've done something great. So Lakeisha believes we have Harriet Tubman in this generation as well. So please join me as we welcome Lakeisha reenacting Harriet Tubman of 2020. Let's go back into the future and see what Harriet would say. My name is Modesty. I am from Ghana. I am here to tell you a story about my life. Mm -hmm. See, I come from a rich family here in Ghana. My mother and father were kings and queens. We had fine clothes, nice jewelry, good food to eat. But one day, I go to my mother and father and I say, I'm going to go out for a stroll and enjoy the sun here. When I went out, I fell asleep next to a tree. The dream let me share with you. In the dream, I had a granddaughter. <laughs> I was only 17 years old. I did not even have a child yet. But I had this dream of my granddaughter. And her name would be called Amita. But she would change her name to Harriet. And she will be known by the world as Moses, the deliverer of her people. In this dream here, it started to get dark. I saw people that did not look like me coming to capture me. The dream bothered me so bad I woke myself up here. No, I don't want to think about that. So I go home. I tell my mother and father about this dream I had here. They said, my child, our family have a gift of dreaming here. 
That's what we do. God has given us that ability. Just go on, child. Go to the marketplace and get me some mango. Okay, mother, that's exactly what I did. As I go down to the marketplace to get the mango meal, I see people running and scattering everywhere. I said, what is going on here? They said, there are two tribes that are feuding against one another. And one tribe has sold the other tribe to those who do not look like us for guns and rice. I said, I don't understand. <laughs> but as people kept running and screaming, I ran myself and someone captured me. I heard them call his name John Green. He captured me. And he took me to the boat here. He took my clothes off here. He chained me to my brothers and sisters from the village here. I screamed for my mother and father, but no one comes to help me here. I get on the boat. And while on the boat, John Green has his way with me. He raped me, but he forbid anyone else to touch me here. He was the only one to touch me. <laughs> My brothers and sisters could not take the torture here. They said they would rather die than to be owned by someone else. So they jumped off the ships here. They fed themselves to the sharks. They say, I will not be a slave, I will die first. I wanted to die too. I wanted to jump off the boat too. But God kept reminding me that my granddaughter will be the deliverer of the people. So, when we got to the shore here, I was pregnant with my daughter, Harriet Green. And my daughter had a daughter, Amita. Just like my dream here, I was able to lay my eyes on my granddaughter, who God had already shown me was coming here. Once I saw her, I was at peace that I had done what God wanted me to do here. I was able to rest <coughs> in peace. So now, I want you all to meet my granddaughter, Harriet Tuckman, the Moses of her people.
could have freed more slaves had they knew they were slaves. But they didn't even know. But now, I'm different. I'm coming for you, even if you don't want to go. I have captured you with the sound of my voice. And we will go and free others. Because I am here to free you from the things that have worn you down and kept you bound. Because one thing is for sure, you have a birth date and you have a death date. And there's no escaping that. So the time in the between is the time for you to find out your purpose and walk in it and live in it. I am here to help you get to a place of freedom in your mind so that you can live in your purpose before you leave this earth. Because we all must go. So, come on. Go with me. Matter of fact, I've already taken you. We're on our way to peace. Let's go. Thank you, Lakeisha, for that wonderful reenactment of Harriet's life and a representation of the current day Harriet Tubman. Now we're so pleased to welcome Miss Rita Daniels, who is the great, great, great grandniece of Miss Harriet Tubman. Miss Rita Daniels became fascinated with the life of Harriet Tubman after she learned that she was the great, great, great grandniece to this iconic woman on her mother's side, her mother sitting behind, beside her. Rita loved her heroism and is proud to be related to such a phenomenal woman and be part of her strong legacy. Harriet Tubman's struggle as a slave is the reason, reason Miss Rita wants her legacy to never go unrecognized or forgotten. Harriet Tubman's life will not be a life that we take for granted. Miss Rita Daniels was born in Auburn, New York, where Harriet Tubman lived the last 52 years of her life. To Milton and Geraldine Copes Daniels, her mother is one of the two last oldest living descendants of Harriet Tubman. She has six sisters and two brothers and is the fourth born. Rita has two adult children, Ronald and Rashana, and four grandchildren, Kiara, Kaylin, Maya, and Amaya. Rita has earned her both, both her master's degrees in education and her bachelor's degree in human resources, cum laude, from Trident University International. After Harriet Tubman managed to escape the severe beatings and humiliation of slavery herself, she put her life on the line over and over again to help others seek freedom. Tubman's entire life consisted of struggle and persistence. Whether she was fighting on behalf of slaves, fighting for the U Union Army during the Civil War, or fighting for women's rights, she could proudly boast, and a quote, I was the conductor of the Underground Railroad for eight years, and I can say what most conductors can't say. I never ran my train off the track, and I never lost a passenger. Please join me in welcoming Ms. Daniels. I was a little teary-eyed over there because I think about my great-great-grandmother modesty and some of the things that she went through. I just, reading her story, I know her story, and every time I hear it, it, it is sad. Um, but one of the things that I can say about modesty was she kept going. It didn't matter what she went through. That's the strength that she has. They lost their names. They had to take someone else's names. They had masters that controlled everything they did. There's no records of some of their births. The lost history. They braved the Underground Railroad and thank God for the Quakers. The Quakers who did not believe in slavery, what they did was something that probably would have been unheard of in some of the things that we have to go through. Um, I think about the passage that they had to go through in order to go from Ghana to the United States, to Maryland, to different parts of the world. 
there was Jamaica, there's Haiti, there's other parts. But my family pretty much came from Ghana and ended up in Maryland. And of course, they ended up my side. Uh, Gary Tubman lived the last 50 years in Auburn, New York. A lot of people don't know about Auburn, New York. Auburn happens to be a very small city in between Rochester and Syracuse, New York. And there are so many people that loved Harriet Tubman at that time. There were Seward, uh, the Senator, there was Garrett, many people who helped Harriet Tubman get from Maryland as a slave to freedom in Philadelphia. December 6, 1840, yes, yeah, uh, <laughs> December 6, 1849 was the day that she stepped into Philadelphia and actually became a free woman. She got that freedom and she worked very hard because she, now that she had a taste of what that freedom was like, she was able to go back and get family members. She made many trips, and as it was mentioned in the skit, that Sarah Bradford sat with her side by side and wrote her story. There's a lot of people in that same book where they had testimonies of knowing who Harriet Tubman was and talked about her bravery and talked about the kind of person she was, that she cared about everyone. It didn't matter her color their color, their creed, or anything. She loved people. And we talked about she was born, they say, in 1820. Some people say 1822, but I go by what Sarah wrote because Sarah sat there with her. I go by the 19 trips that she went and made back to Philadelphia. Her last trip was where she got her parents. And she took her parents to Auburn, New York. Many people, they called Canada was part of it. They called that the uh, bound for the promised land. And they called Canada the promised land. Many people couldn't go as far as Auburn, New York because there were bounties on their heads. So they had to deterred their their trips. They went even as far as changing their direction so they would not get caught. And I just think about being a descendant of Harriet Tubman that I can't even imagine some of the things that she went through. It's very hard for me. And all I can say is, I'm here today. And that is what I'm here for, to let everyone know that Harriet Tubman's legacy continues to work. We have started the Harriet Tubman Learning Center. We were having some issues, of course, because it's mostly financial. To get this thing up and running, we I've already been to Philadelphia, Baltimore, Birmingham, Alabama, different areas where we need a program like the Heritage Learning Center that has descendants involved because I think that just makes it more legitimate. You're going to use the name, you may as well have the descendants a part of it. But there are a lot of museums, Heritage Heaven's name is being used, and that's okay because as long as it's not where you're degrading this woman. We're here to make sure that the likeness of Harriet Tubman continues and that it's in a positive uh, demeanor. Of course, there are some people who portray Harriet Tubman as a prostitute. Um, Russell Simmons, we had that parody out about five years ago. So, for someone that was an iconic woman as she was, for a person like him, who has media, he has all the avenues to put things out on the internet. 
in that video without he didn't have to take it down like it was 24 hours because they had so many people calling him, letting him know how degrading it was. She was a powerful woman. And as Lakeisha said, or as Harriet said, or my, she was four feet eleven. But that strength within her was something that was able to, she was able to make all these trips. I could never be a Harriet Tubman. And I don't stand here to say that I could. But because her blood runs through me, a portion of me, because it's been a hundred years, hundred plus years since she passed away. But I will say that I am just glad today that we can continue with the legacy because it needs to continue here. We have about six generations behind me to keep that legacy going. And so the Harry Kevin Learning Center is going to, it will flourish. It will become what it needs to be. Just as Martin Luther King, they've got the King Center. They've got Harriet Tubman. They've got statues and so forth, but they don't have a learning center that is actually associated with the descendants. So that is what we're working on, and that is where we're going. It will come to fruition very soon. And that is because that's our dream. We dream just like Harriet Tubman. And just as she made her trips with help, she didn't do it on her own. And thank God for those people that care, for, for those Quakers and for those people that even once she got to Philadelphia, they helped her. She actually changed her name to Harriet just like her mother. Her mother's name was Harriet. They called her Rip. But when Harriet Tubman got her freedom, they asked her, is that the name you want to keep? But she had a choice to change her name. Not many had that choice. So one of the things I do want to do is show you a presentation that I had in this slide. And if I'm not sure how to get it on the screen. Okay, some of you people might know who these people are. You know, this person here at the bottom left, that is Miss Lakeisha. And one thing that drew her to me, and vice versa, is that I was here in September, here in Washington, went to a congression of outreach. And she came over to me and just hugged me and my mom because she said she loves Harriet Tubman. You can tell by her display of the play that she did when you did a very excellent job. But this is her when she had her husband drive her all the way to Auburn, New York, just for the day, just to go to Harriet Tubman's gravesite, which is in Auburn, New York. And this is her hugging the tombstone. And I know she said she put her lips on that. <laughs> and Bob, she goes, they have the pilgrimage every single year. And I don't know if it's still there, it might have been rained off, it's been a while. But the two people in the middle, that is my mother on the right in the yellow, and that is her sister, Pauline. There's Pauline and Geraldine, both sisters. Aunt Pauline is 92, same age to hear telling her when she passed away. And my mother, and so this is what they continue visiting. It's called a pilgrimage. And that is hosted every single year in Auburn, New York. Of course, that is me and my mother, where uh, that might have been, or should have been the first thing, but I kind of haven't got to it. Um, just show who I am and how we are the founders of the Harriet Tubman Learning Center. And this happens to be a portrait that was just painted within the last 60 days. And I, there's going to be a grand showing of this portrait next week, actually. But the artist sent me pictures that I could make copies of. 
So if anyone wanted to be a part or wanted to have one of these pictures, we do have some, and we'll figure out how that can be done. Also, this is just our lineage, and it goes from Gaskin and Copes, Modesty and John Green, they gave birth to Henrietta, Henrietta Mary Benjamin Croft. They gave birth to nine children. You see Sophie in the green and Araminta. Araminta, which is Harriet, who did not have children, so let's just make that clear. Sophie, the sister of uh, Araminta, Sophie had given birth to Anne Marie. Anne Marie married Thomas Elliot and gave birth to Marietta. And so if you follow just the green, you'll see how we go. Marietta happens to be my great grandmother. And she married Philip Gaskin. Phil Gaskin and Marietta gave birth to my grandmother, who is Jenny. This is Jenny. My grandmother, my mother's mother. Okay, so Jenny married Guy Copes, and they had five children. Jeanette, William, Arlene, they're all deceased, of course, right now. And the only two that are living is Pauline and Geraldine. Geraldine and Pauline both had one, my mother had nine children, just like, just like uh, the Rosses. And my Aunt Pauline had it up. So when I say our legacy continues, it does. Because Mother right now has about 90 grandchildren, great-grandchildren, adopted children, and so forth. So <laughs> it continues. And so Aunt Pauline, she's got the same thing. So just a lot of grandchildren. Now I only had two. So. We are part of that 90 plus. But next, we have, this is the last will and testament of Harriet Tubman. What I have are copies. They are not the originals. But we have it circled in there. It has Marietta happens to be mentioned in her will which is my great grandma, was one of Carrie Tubbins' favorite nieces mentioned in that will. Here we have received proclamations, mostly my mother, these are from my mom, from the City of New York proclamation. As a matter of fact, over on the left side, another one from Rochester, New York, it has a Geraldine Coke Daniels Day. <laughs> so there are a lot of proclamations that we had received throughout naming Harriet Tubman Day is March 10th. Every single year we go to the governor's or, and, and, and get that same proclamation. The first proclamation actually was written by the president, President Bush. And not the later George, the George Bush, but the first George Bush president. <laughs> and so he he named March 10th as a Harriet Tubman Day. And one of the other things that we are working on is naming December 6th as Harriet Tubman Freedom Day because that's when she got her freedom. And that really relates to everybody because Harriet Tubman was a person of all people. But I'm just showing some of the proclamations and things that we have um, been involved in or have received. You'll see me up in that top corner where this person is bringing me a dozen of roses and I was speaking at that event. Um, me again, I'm at the National Congress of Black Women here in Washington where that's where I met Lakeisha, so that was in September. Here we have my mom, here again, where she, they have her as a living legacy. There's a lot of pictures of her. Uh, I believe that was one that she went to Ghana 
and they did an installment with my Aunt Pauline and my mother. So I'm just going through these quickly. My mother and Aunt Pauline, again, are sitting right here in the front with the king over there in Ghana. Um, they had been there in like 12 days, I believe. So there's a lot that we are embracing. Here we have the Harry Tubman Memorial Highway, which is in Auburn, New York. And I don't remember how far it stretches, but it's 100 miles? I believe it's about a 100 mile stretch. Auburn to Rochester in Syracuse, it's Harry Tubman Memorial Highway. We also, in the picture to the right, the person to the left of that is Aunt Bertie. She passed away a few years ago, and she was able to attend the family reunion. There's a portrait that they're painting, a mural that my nephew painted of Harriet Tubman. And there's my mother and Aunt Pauline. Aunt Pauline has a black hat on, and my mother is to the right. Here we have done some more celebrations, and uh, that's me at the bottom corner there. This is my mom and Aunt Pauline were in Auburn. I'm sorry, we were in Washington at the Congress. Um, another picture where up at the top we're following her footsteps. In the middle is this one person. He just loved my mom and Aunt Pauline, so he wanted to make sure that they embraced it. Uh, right here we have the two oldest descendants of Harriet Tubman on the right and the left, of course. But the one on the right is they're dressed in white with Harriet Tubman's portrait behind, showing their relationship with Harriet Tubman. And as of right now, they are the two oldest living descendants of Harriet Tubman. This one here was something that was cropped with a new picture that was just recently painted that has not been released yet. So you couldn't go online and find it. And that's me on the right. Yeah, you're right. These are some of the pictures that's out there of Harriet Tubman. And you'll see that street name, Harriet Ross Tubman Avenue. That's a street name that was given to my mother. She came to my home with a street sign. So we put that together. This picture down here is of the, the latest picture, and I happened to find this picture of Harriet Tubman in um, one of those stores they have antique. It was in an antique store. Actually, she was 26 years old in that picture, and I only paid nine dollars for it. I don't know what the value is now, but it, right now it's in my library. Oops. Here, the Harry coming home. This is Auburn. This is where she lived in one of those homes. But the Harry Tubman Home for the Aged is one of the most popular places now. We have a Miss Smith. She was the operator who worked at the Harry Tubman Home. And that picture with all of these people sitting in front of the building. Those are some of the slaves that Harry Tubman had um, retrieved from slavery. Another picture of Harriet Tubman is the one on the left. And I apologize for this last picture because someone was adjusting it and we didn't have time to fix it so we could actually see it. But Harriet Tubman is on the left. Her parents are the two on the far right. And all the other people were not aware of who they are. Here, Harriet Tubman also, these are where they had a reunion because she was very old, got to a point where she couldn't do a lot. You see how petite she is in that chair. And these are some of the other slaves that she had freed. Here we have the marriage of Harriet Tubman to Nelson Davis. 
here is showing their marriage certificate on the right, the death certificate of Nelson Davis. Again, we have over here to the right, this Harriet Tubman's death certificate. The picture at the top is Harriet Tubman's room, where she is getting ready to be lowered into the ground. But there's three people on that picture who are, I guess they would be grandmothers by now. One would be a great, great, great aunt, but that went she died September, I'm sorry, 13, March, March 13th, 1913. No, I'm sorry, she died March 10th, I'm getting some title here. March 10th, 1913 in Auburn, New York. That's another uh, picture of some of the people that were freed during the time. And that is another great site. And here's another one where they celebrate her death. One of the things I'm going to move to now is this picture here. That is pictures of Harriet Tubman who, this year she was supposed to be put on the $20 bill. However, it was pulled away and I believe that the due date is supposed to be in 2026. One of the things that people have done now is they have gone online and purchased a stamp, a rubber stamp, and put their name on top of um, Andrew Jackson. And I'm told it's legal because as long as you're not messing with serial numbers and certain things, people write on money all the time. So that's what they have done. I don't own one of those stamps, but I'm just saying. They are available. I don't sell them either. So. <laughs> and here, these are different statues of Harriet Tubman. One, mostly the center, two center pictures, are the ones where Harriet Tubman is in Harlem. And it's one of the tallest statues. And at that particular time, when that was built, my mom was able to go and cut the, the ribbon when they were, uh, they had the ceremony and so on the back of it, it has roots on it and it's showing some of the areas that she went through. This statue is in Auburn. Um, they're just all over, there's Baltimore, you name, it, they're all over the place. And there's more statues. This here is the one that said Auburn where the Harriet Tubman home is. This, you'll see down here is the Harriet Tubman home. This is where that statue is. This is her home. And over there is another part of this property where she had purchased from uh, Senator Stewart. And my favorite, of course, this is not coming in the way that I want it. That is our logo for the Harriet Tubman Learning Center. It has Harriet Tubman's photo in the middle, and it should be a lot better, but we were putting this together very quickly. That's what we have there. And then, um, this is, you know, I, <laughs> I had to laugh because I found this building and I fell in love with it. I have put my logo on it because I'm claiming it. I'm claiming that building, it needs some work, but it's 29,000 square feet. I don't know if there's anyone out there that grew up in the community center, but I did. And the Harry Tubman Learning Center will be a community center. It has a lot of potential. So they haven't sold it yet on this, but um, we're trying to raise the money to, to get that. And it's about almost $2 million but it's perfect for what we're looking for. These are some of my students. Then the robotics program, STEM program, science, technology, engineering, math. We've got them building 
all kinds of things. We're youth entrepreneurs. This is one of the classes that we had where they were playing games and we're trying to get them to understand what, what um, business is all about. And it's very diverse. The Learning Center is not just for African Americans, it's for everyone. As I mentioned, Harriet Tubman loved the Quakers. She loved everybody, and that's what we offer the love from everyone. This one here, we had Harriet Tubman. We had Tubman batteries because one of the things that we came up with was she was very energetic. So the energy, <laughs> and so our students, they were selling batteries for that. And here, uh, the students were at a engineering affair, a uh, robotics affair. And so we had to raise money to send some of our boys to these programs. Here we were on the bottom picture we had in Georgia, even a judge, Melton. He came and he talked to all of these students about their futures and how he makes decisions when he's in a court. And he did say to them, if you commit a crime, there is normally a time that you have to serve for that crime. But when they come to him, he does go by their emotions. And this was something that I never heard before. If that student or child is very emotional about what he did and very Forgiving and he said sometimes their sentence may be a lot like, but some of them come in their subs. And so he talked to them about what it's like coming to his courtroom. And that's how he makes decisions. Not all the time, but and this is me over here in the front leading them through a courthouse. They got to go in the courtroom, see what it's like, sit in the the chair where they are the person that committed a crime. They had people who pretended to be judges and they got to see what a jail looked like. And those are some of the things that we're working on with, with the students. Here, that we're just outside of the courtroom, not to mention we also had um, Justice Thomas. He lives in this area and he spoke beforehand and talked about what he does as a judge. And a Supreme Court Justice is who he is. And these are uh, some of my students putting together robots. Here, I did not put their faces on it because their parents did not sign um, a release. So these are just robots that they built that's just part of it. That is, they learn the wiring, they learn how to code. So we're pretty much advanced. And I just want people to know that uh, these are underserved children who enjoy coming to the Learning Center. And that is the last of my presentation. Here is some of my ways if anyone wants to uh, donate to the Learning Center. These are our credentials. If anyone has any questions, I'm open. At this time, we'll take questions from anyone in the audience, or Ms. Rita, or Ms. Geraldine. Just trying to figure out, going through the family tree, and the Greens, Rosses, Hopes, Daniels, where does, and she was married to um, Nelson John Davis? Tubman. Well, she was married to John Tubman. John Tubman, that's, I was just trying to figure out where Tubman came in. Through John Tubman. Thank you. John Tubman. That was her first marriage. She was married to Tubman. Mm -hmm. Have you met here? Oh, can you come? No, she's been um, dead for about 170 years now. So, we're just continuing the legacy of, of uh, our ancestry. We just know that Harry Tubman still lives within us. Hello. Hi. Um, I'm Nigerian American. So in Nigeria when it's coming up, when we had to discuss uh, Harriet Tubman, we used to fight over who does Harriet, belo Harriet belong to. We knew that your ancestry was from Ghana, but Nigeria, since we were a prouder people, 
that we thought. We want to claim you as well. So in my language, I would say, Esheo, Ebenio Bopa, Momio say, I thank you, I love you, and we appreciate you for thanking all of our ancestors. Well, one of the things I can say about Harriet Tubman, even though Africa is Africa, it doesn't matter what province or however it's done, it could be Ghana, it could be the coast, it doesn't matter, but it's Africa. That's where her roots are. So yes, Nigeria is just, just right. There's Kenya also. So like I said, she's a person of all people. Yes. Hello. I'm just curious, how did you find out that you wanted to send it out? Right? Is this something you've always been in your family or, you know, I'm just curious. Well, my mother can tell you how old she was when she found out that she was Harry Tubman niece. Yes, you don't. No. Well, at first, I knew who Harriet Tubman was, but I didn't realize that she was an aunt of mine. I didn't realize that until I was in my 20s. And while I was in my 20s, when we were told that she is our real aunt, by one of my other aunts. And uh, we said, this is not true. But we went through some different things and so we found out, yes, she is. She found out when she was 21, or in her 20s, and I found out I was 9 when I found out. And a lot of that was because I had to do a birth certificate. Yeah. 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 I'm, to me, I you know, I was when I grew up, I did not see any parts of segregation. Some of my best friends were African American, white, uh, Asian, you name it. So very diverse, from kindergarten all the way up. It wasn't until I was about 13 when my dad took me to Alabama. That's where I experienced a time where it was one of the, it was not a, a good time anyway. I went to Alabama. He took us to a movie. There was myself and two brothers and a cousin. The cousin, we get to the movie and the cousin goes upstairs. And I'm heading to the door where everybody else was going. And I get called back. And I'm finding that it's segregated, that I have to go upstairs and, and all the white um, people got to go downstairs. So all I can say is I never saw the movie. Because I stood on those stairs, I sat on those stairs until my dad came back and got me. Because I, to me, it just tore me apart because why would it be so different in the South compared to where I'm from. Mind you, Harriet Tubman lived in Auburn, New York the last 50 plus years of her life. My mother was born a free woman. My, I didn't know what slavery was like, so when my mom told me that I was related to a slave, at nine, the first thing in my mind is, why? I mean, why would I be proud of being related to a slave, because I, what I, in, in the school books and all the things that we read, in those books it talked about how she was a fugitive, how she had um, a $40,000 bounty on her head. Why would I want to be associated with it? I mean, it wasn't until I was able to learn more 
from my family, my mother, my aunt, everyone. I just kept going on and I mean I had a lot of tears too because I wasn't sure if I was supposed to be happy about it, should I be ashamed or what because she did what she did. But as time went by, it grew up on me. One of her things, her models was to keep going. And so I kept researching and kept finding out. So in the long run, I went back to school at the age of 60 to get my master's degree in education because she did not have an education. I mean, I still have to pay for that money, but <laughs> I still have that to pay for. It. But the the joy of being related, knowing now what I know, what I didn't know then, it was as time went by, I got to be more comfortable in. There's still people who don't want to hear about hear it coming, and we're like, oh, okay, no big deal. But it should be a big deal because this is a woman. Compared to men, there's men who are all over, but a woman who made these trips, how can I not be proud of her? How can I not be proud of her? So I'm just saying that she's a person that will always be a part of my life, no matter what. My, my children, my son's 40, my daughter's 37. And they are in love with Harriet. I mean, they love what I'm doing. And as time goes by, as I get older, they're going to take over the learning center. They both have their math. They have their education. And that's what we push, education. That is even for those that can't. Not everyone is college bound. So that's why the STEM program is for the underserved. Because there's kids who are failing in school, but they can certainly do a robot. They just want that chance. And that is what we're doing good. We're putting on that olive branch to those that want to be more successful without. Did you use Ancestry.com or any of the, um, the DNA to find out other family members that are out there? for you doing the family tree? I did. Um, I wanted to know who I was, where I came from, and so I was able to find relatives. A lot of my ancestry is in Ghana. There is different parts. Uh, but I also have, I also have a little bit of, I, I also have Irish because my grandfather, my mom's dad, was Irish and African American, and then my grandmother Indian. So I have a lot of spread out there. So we had Philippines, we had Spain, um, small percentages, but the bigger percentages had was various parts of of Africa. That's including Congo and and, and so forth. So, but most of most of who I am, the, the Indian part as well, but it's just a mixture. Did your family take part in the uh, the movie, Harriet? Okay, so the movie we were not um, we were not called upon for any information, but there are descendants still in Maryland who were reached out to. And as a matter of fact, the person that wrote that last book on Harry Cover, her name is Kate Larson, she was the writer and she found people that agreed with her research. So that means that based on her research, the movie portrays Harry Cover as making only seven tricks and only three of seven displays. And so I was I was asked about that, and I said, well, how does she, and that was based on her research. Now, she's 20th century, you know, she's probably my age. And so when she did her research, she said she went and gathered all this information, and that's how she determined that. But you have to remember, Harry Kevin was a runaway. She was not going to City Hall or any place to document her, her leaving. This was all done in secrecy. So I, 
You can put down, that's what your research tells you, but my research tells it takes me to Sarah Graffin's book. Sarah Graffin is the only person that actually sat with her. And then in the back of that book, it also has information about people who, who can say, I know her. Frederick Douglass, there's other people who are in there who knew she made many, many trips. Some of them were halfway. She didn't have to go all the way. There were people who were already on the way trying to get through the underground. And some people don't understand what the underground railroad is. It has nothing to do with traveling underground. The underground had everything to do with safe houses. Different safe houses that she would go to and she would get information where to go to the next place. And she would have these dreams. She had not a lot of So she would have this dream while she's in her deep sleep. And sometimes it was 90 minutes, could be longer. They, no one would bother her when she fell asleep. But when she woke up, she was ready for her journey. And she's ready to take these people to where they need to go. And that is to the freedom, to the land of the freedom. grateful for your time and your research and all of the information that you shared with us. Um, there isn't enough information that we're learning in school about Harriet Tubman's life. I think it's critical that we continue to carry on her legacy. So thank you for sharing all of this with us. Um, I want to give a special thanks to Lakeisha Davis who organized this event for today. We also want to thank uh, Joe who's helping us out with IT and for everything Thank you to all of you who have taken time out of the time. Let's ask her what she did. I thought it was wonderful. I really enjoyed it. Um, it was a breathtaking moment for history, yes. especially during our month of yes. Black History. So I really enjoyed it. Yes. Do you want to say? Uh, well, I think it was very interesting because I'm doing a history project on Harriet Tubman, so this was giving me a big opportunity to um, get some answers that uh, yeah. it's not really on social media. Thank you for great presentation. Uh, a lot of interesting information, great information on Harriet Tubman. Great way to spend uh, Black History Month.
are there. <laughs> <laughs>